Okay. Hello. Lisa. Hello, Dr. Christie, are you? Uh, okay. I'm ready. I'm in the right room, I guess. Awesome. Kind of yes. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, it's very nice to meet you. My, doc my name is Dr. Austin Donovan. Um, again, to introduce myself, this is my first AI Institute. Very excited to be a part of this. Um, Dr. Christie is the VP of Educational Innovations and Exclusivity with Alchemy, and he will be presenting on AI personalization um, of learning and development. So oh, yeah. very excited. Fuck. All right. Thank you, Dr. Donovan. And I know we have people still joining in. People. So should I dive in, take over screen share? Yep. Go ahead. You Great. All you. I'll do that. Let me get to the right tab here and bear with me. Oh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. Maybe if you want to make me a co-host. Or I'll try that again. Nope. Austin, is this your room? Yes. Let me just. It's my room. I already did it. Oh, oh, so oh. I'll try again. Okay. okay. Austin, you have to stop sharing. Yes. There we go. Okay, now I've got it. Thank you. All right. I'll take a breath. <laughs> we'll get into a flow here. And let me go ahead and go into share mode, or excuse me, presentation mode. And then put the technology behind us for a moment. Let me get um, participant and chat. Okay. Hearing me now again? Yep. All is good. Thank you. Okay. And I want to make sure I get chat up because I do want to try and pay attention, even though I know there's a fairly sizable group. I do want to try and be responsive in real time here. Um, thank you for coming to this session where we'll look at AI for personalized learning and development. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. I was glad that um, Jeff Kane reached out and glad to be here and be part of the team's effort for this, um, this institute. And I know we have a lot of people from the state of Washington and beyond. Uh, myself, I'm based in Olympia, Washington. For those that are out of the area, that would be between Seattle and Portland, just to give you a little orientation. Um, I'll go ahead and dive in now a little bit about myself. I've been in higher ed for um, about 30 years now and worked as an instructor. My background is curriculum and instruction, so I've worked in education, educational technology, and then pretty early on got into faculty development and mentoring through all sorts of grants and campus efforts, and then eventually it was a system-wide um, faculty de developer for the Cal State system. Um, in the last stretch of my career in higher ed, proper. And then I retired out from that, from that. And now I work for Alchemy, which, which is an educational innovations company. I won't talk a whole lot about Alchemy today. I'm not here to pitch heavily or do anything like that. At the end, I will share some of the things we're doing that are related to today's topic, though. Um, but that'll be brief. And then you can decide whether you want to dive into some of those resources or, or not. Um, the way that I view AI is as a creative companion in that you are the subject matter expertise, you are the design expertise, you're the learning science expert, whatever roles you carry yourself, you hold on to that as you go forward with AI, and you'll be able to guide it, but also steer it and correct it as needed as you go forward. And you want to make sure that you're able to do that effectively, but also make sure that things are ethical and equitable in what you're doing with AI for yourself and for your students. And that was a great Opening keynote today, I, I got a great lot of great resources from that as well. So that's my take on AI. I'm definitely um, an adopter, very excited about what's been happening in the last couple of years, but I'm also empathetic for those who find it overwhelming because it is a lot and it's moved very quickly. And it's still, a, it's a long learning curve for most. There's that AI um, literacy that's still being built up by many as individuals and also um, programs and institutions. Um, but let's go forward in a positive light and just think about what's possible with AI. And related to my look at it as a creative companion is don't think about what's left for you because of AI. Think about what's possible for you because of AI and how you can hold that going forward because there's still so much that you hold and can do and can interact with your students on that human level 
Um, and an AI can be an enabler for more of that to happen and not take it all away. And let's do a quick pulse check on how you would define personalized learning before I go through a little bit of framing research, which won't take long, and then we'll get into examples. So how would you define? And we're going to go into a Padlet real quick. And so I'm going to copy and paste that into chat. QR code if that helps you, but I imagine most of you are going to want to do the link that I just put into the chat. And you'll have that in the chat, so that allows me to go ahead and go there. And let's see what populates. If you're not familiar with Padlet, most of you probably are by now, that bottom right, you can click the plus icon and go ahead and add your definition around personalized learning. And then I'll do a little bit of reacting in real time and I'll talk about what I'll do with the results and how I'll share that out with you. Okay, so I see a number of you populating word, about 62 participants. And I see about a quarter in Padlet so far. And I'll keep clicking refresh so that we do get updates more often than the default refresh that Padlet does. Student drives task definition. I like that. Uh, the task definition, but also the process. Um, they can define it or it can also be responsive to them. Uh, move at your own pace. Great. Meet students where they are. I always love that. Yeah. And, and in my role, I've always tried to say, meet faculty where they are in, in serving and helping faculty rather than trying to drag or pull or push. It's how can you get into someone's space and be there for them, no matter what the role is. Love what's coming here. Accounting for existing skills, yeah, and then building from that. So you'll see that scaffolding and those, those types of things that I'll talk about. Just in time, tailored learning to the student just in time, in the moment, yes. So often the learning experience, they, they'll do something, but then they're waiting and waiting and waiting to hear how well they did that and what they could do differently. Um, so we'll talk about how AI can enable some of those things as well. I won't get to all of these comments, obviously, but I, I love the sharing across the group. You'll have access to the Padlet ongoing. That'll be accessed from the slide, but also, again, I'll talk about how I'll um, process these and come up with some results. Let's see, engaging with new material to increase competency and mastery through strategies and learning styles that are compatible with the way your brain learns. Love that, love that. I would I would pick at learning styles. There's a lot of research that has debunked that there are distinct learning styles, but I get what you mean for sure, um, that it's more of a spectrum. Okay, great. I'm gonna back out for you know part time consideration. We get a late start, so I'm gonna back out of that. I appreciate it. That adds to the conversation greatly. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll go back to our slides and get us back into full screen. So on the next slide of the slide deck, I have a placeholder because I'm going to take the Padlet, I'm going to export that as CSV, and I'm going to analyze it through ChatGPT, and then I'll be able to put the results here for you. And so you'll see a summarized list. You'll see kind of a consensus statement and then a bulleted list of the, the top ideas, the main ideas that you all shared um, so that's a neat feature that you can do with Padlet. Padlet, if you're not aware, that's a great way to leverage AI to process a conversation and then reflect it back to students, have a conversation with students. So I don't know if any of you have tried that before. It works really well. If you're doing things in class where you have students posting things on poster boards with Post-its, you can take pictures and upload those into ChatGPT and process those and follow up on conversations. Uh, but for now, I'll keep going on today's topic. Okay, so a little bit on research on personalization and student success. Let me get chat back. Sorry. I'm not Just really sure. Right, maybe. Okay, a little bit on some of the research around personalization and student success. So going back a couple thousand years to Socrates, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but I wanna give attribution to some of these people that really paved the way as to where we are today. So Socrates really looking at individualized questioning to, to help critical thinking and form personalized meaning. Um, Rousseau and the, and the stages of development, the four stages of development, that at least helped to start chunking things. And you could look at where children might be on track or might be behind, behind and need support in certain areas of development um, in education and otherwise. And then Vygotsky has been a big one in my career, that zone of proximal development. Where is the individual learner on a specific task 
at any given point? And how can you best meet them in that space? Because if you can meet them in that space, you can help move them forward at their pace. And a lot of you um, alluded to that in your comments on the Padlet. So, you know, I'm a believer if we could see students' zone of proximal development just by scanning their eyes, um, we would be able to just be able to be in the moment with them. Um, and AI can do a little bit of that for sure. Um, Blooms, you you know Blooms through Blooms Taxonomy if, for sure. Um, that can be a great thing to reflect on your teaching and what you're asking students to do. Um, Bloom, I'll talk about the Two Sigma problem on the next slide and how that relates to some of the data. Um, with Tomlinson, Tomlinson, she came up with differentiated instruction, which is great for being able to adapt your curriculum and the learning environment to students' uh, preferences and their abilities and their interests. That's a lot to juggle, um, with, especially as class sizes go up. Um, but that is something that is a goal, is an ideal for sure. And Bruce Olofsky started talking about adaptive hy hypermedia. So adaptive learning has been around for a while, but it's always been sort of a closed box, often based on a, um, a publisher's content, their textbook, and then they've developed adaptive learning media around that. Um, but it's a closed box where something like AI is a more open um, instance where there can be broader learning and more personalized learning that goes outside of that fixed adaptive learning experience or um, software, I should say. So that's just a quick scan, but in looking at Blooms, because this really kind of props up, Blooms did this two sigma design and looked at conventional classroom instruction. One instructor and all students treated the same in general and moving forward through the curriculum, which is a uniform set. Um, toward those uniform standards. And then comparing that to students who had one-on-one -on -one tutoring experiences where each student had their own individualized and personalized instruction from that tutor. Um, you might be able to guess the results, but the official results is students with a one-on-one -on -one tutor did better than 98% of the traditional or control group. Um, why don't we have one-on-one -on -one tutors for everyone then? Well, we have the challenges of feasibility and scalability. Um, and there's also the issue sometimes of the experience varying based on the tutor and how good they are. Um, sometimes there's ethical issues and equitable issues. Um, there are people who can pay for the best tutors. There are people who have um, college career coaches and all those things, get, prepping them get to get into, you know, I call them groomers instead of tutors, but there's that equity piece as well, which I think that um, AI can definitely help solve. So now with AI, we've certainly got some exponential leaps forward where we look at tutoring or personalized learning. And some of the top benefits, so personalization will focus on tutoring I've mentioned. I'm, I'm sensitive around the word tutor because it does sometimes have a negative stigma. We often will send struggling students over to be the tutoring center to be tutored because they aren't able to figure it out the way you would want them to in the time that you would want them to. But this is really bringing it in in a positive aspect. It's their guide. You can call it different things. Um, grading, we're now capable beyond just answer keys with AI. It can do much more responsive. It can do timely and effective feedback, which to me is, is one of the most critical things is that students receive timely and effective feedback to their work so that they can learn from it and keep iterating in real time. But too often they have to wait forever and don't get it timely or don't get it in effective means. Um, and then also for the instructor feedback on course quality. And that's a lot of the work that I'm doing currently with Alchemy. So this actually comes from 2017. We had Gen AI come out via chat GPT at large um, in 2022. So this was some good forethinking about this. And um, I liked how it connected to today's topic so well, even though it came out before most of us were thinking about AI and education. Okay, my chat went away. I just want to make sure there aren't any red flags popping up or, or questions I should address. Um, in thinking about some examples, I think how many of you have used Duolingo? Feel free in the chat to just, um, you know, pop in. But Duolingo is something that's been, been around for quite a while, but it's it's been able to do its own leap forward because of AI. Um, it's become so much more developed and responsive for the individual learner, where before it was more like adaptive learning, where it was more of a fixed program. Now it's extremely responsive. 
And so students are able to interact and it's, and it's based on learning science. They can do it anytime, anywhere. They can do it in small bites, but it keeps track of what they've done, what they've done and at what pace and how successful. And it props them up for the next level when they're ready. And it'll backfill whenever they might have issues at the next level with a particular concept that maybe didn't go forward as it should have. Um, it's standardized where it needs to be. Um, it helps them with through gamification and socialization. And it helps them build confidence by and through enjoyment. Um, that zone of proximal development that I talked about earlier. In my background, originally kinesiology and, and thinking about being a PE teacher, we wanted to have students have 80% success on a task because they got that feeling of success and accomplishment, but it always left a bar above that that they could try and achieve toward next. Um, so you wanted that type of balance. And so this is that zone of proximal development. Uh, thanks for the comment related to consistency. Um, I'm not a language expert, so it's great to have somebody weigh in who might be uh, diamond level, love it. <laughs> So yeah, this is something that I've experienced. My daughter pulled me in. She's um, you know minor in Spanish, and she stays on top of it by doing some Duolingo things and and just enjoys it. But um, so it's great because you have the skills. You do the pre-assessment. It can then set you up, and then you advance as you're ready to through the different types of things, through the basics phrases. It brings in animals and different types of scenarios and helps to prepare you for different types of things. You get experience points, you are working socially, you might be just comparing with strangers, or you might have a friend group that you're um, kind of gaming with, and then you're able to do the interaction in many different ways. It could be drag and drop, it could be typing, it could be verbal, it could be listening and responding. So lots of different things that you can experience in that gamified, personalized way, which I think is a good example. Of course, this is maybe a little bit juvenile looking for some of our college students and for some of our instructors, but it has the same concept. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Conmigo. So when um, ChatGPT came out in November 2022, early 23, Salomon Khan was already talking about his vision um, related to AI and, and talked about Conmigo early on. And it's actually um, been used by many people and has been continually, continually developing. It's all about personalized tutoring, if you will. Um, it's about democratizing access to personalized education. So the cost for K through 12 educators, it's free to be able to use it as an educator for students and others. It's $4 a month or $44 a year. So $11 a month if you do an annual. Now think about that $4 a year to have access to a tutor and how much that does create a more equitable plane of access to that type of one-on-one -on -one support or experience. Um, that's huge. Um, and that's easy to subsidize as well at such a small cost. Um, you have these learning paths for users, and I'll show a screenshot briefly that any, anytime, anywhere access, you're not waiting for the tutoring center, you're not waiting for the instructor to be available, you're not waiting for your peer study group to all get together. Um, and then um, that'll be enough saying on what Conmigo is about. I think people get it by now. Um, I see an instructor share. Thank you for that. And there's more coming into the learning management system as well. That's exciting if it can all be in one space. Um, so this is an example with Conmigo and, and an interaction where a student's being helped with math, math or science, but in this case, math. And so the um, tutor is asking, well, tell me the type of problem or exercise you're working on and has already said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do the work for you, but I'm going to help you think it through and I'm going to help you get through the different steps. So long division, they start working on that. There's this conversation, this exchange that takes place um, where it responds to the students based on statements they've made or answers they've submitted, how they've been successful or where they've made mistakes and how they can clean that up. So this is this is really exciting and powerful and it'll continue to, to evolve. Um, obviously there's a lot of investment around Khan Academy. They're even looking at you know actual schools built around models like this where there can be so much more assistance provided to the students and the instructors being able to be more active enablers of the learning experience and the humanized elements. Okay, this is one I came across um, this week, specifically looking at this session. I thought it was an interesting example. This is Middlesex Community College and they've adapted this Critique Crowd app, which is just a simple way for a student to put in a writing sample and get feedback. And this is uh, you know, affiliated with their institution. And so this is what, something they're wanting students to do to kind of pre-check their writing level and get a little bit of feedback. So 
here's one on how to perform a task. So I put in a paragraph and with the Olympics and my background decades in swimming, I put in what I thought a paragraph would be to tell somebody how to do a flip turn. And so I got feedback right away and they try and contextualize it. They try and make it fun. You know, well, flip me sideways and call me a dolphin. This paragraph and executing a flip turn is smoother than a freshly waxed surfboard. And it goes on and on. It gives me some good feedback um, on grammar. And then it goes forward that into looking at the paragraph more deeply. I get some feedback from um, hype man Hector um, about the types of words that I'm using and the impact those are having. That's great. But then I get some feedback from Real Talk Rachel saying, well, you know, that's great, but you're assuming a lot of prior knowledge from your reader. What's a dolphin kick? How close is near to the wall? So there would need to be a little bit more clarity and consideration of the level of people who may not have done a flip turn before and how it can actually be performed. So that was just one example that I thought it was, a, was a good way for and a light way for students to put in some writing and just safely sort of one-on-one -on -one through this system, get some feedback and be able to reflect on what they could do better. So we'll see more and more of these types of apps. Punch forward here. Have any of you seen this, ex this experiment from Google called Illuminate? I'll jump to this briefly here because I just think it's really, really cool. And I, I found this when I was doing a, a UDL presentation um, back in Massachusetts for the uh, Department of Ed there. And I was looking at different technologies, of course, to add into the whole UDL, UDL framework and experience. And this is one that Google is working on where they'll take research-based articles, they'll use AI to turn those articles into conversations. And so let me show you an example briefly here. So if I go down to this bottom article, I can click on view source and click on that link and it takes me to the actual research article. Now this is a 13 page article that's pretty dense stuff about a technical topic and it's very text-based and very, you know, a lot of jargon and all of that. So I may not wanna consume it this way. I may not be a visual learner. I may not be able to read. This may not be accessible. Whatever the, the reasons are, preference or otherwise, this isn't necessarily gonna do it for me. It's gonna be overwhelming. I'm not going to be able to come away with a base understanding. But if I go back to Illuminate and click on the play button, oh no, and share, did I, I, let me stop and start share, make sure I put on audio, share sound, okay. Of course, I picked the wrong screen. There we go. Okay, and hopefully this will play for you. Ready to break down some research? This paper, Trusted Source Alignment in Large Language Models, explores how well large language models, or LLMs, can align with trusted sources when answering questions. Joining us is an AI expert. Welcome. This feels like a timely topic given discussions on AI's potential for misinformation. Could you share the core idea behind Trusted Source Alignment, or TSA, and why it matters? Absolutely. You're spot on about the timeliness. Trusted source alignment is all about gauging whether these AI models, especially LLMs. Okay. Did that come through the sound, the audio? Okay. I'm seeing some nodding and thumbs up. Alex, any thoughts on that? That is pretty cool. So again, they've taken that article and they've run it through AI and basically said, okay, take this and turn it into a conversation between the authors or between an interviewer and the author and humanize it and make it a dialogue that's understandable and that um, somebody can follow. And so this now brings it into a resource where somebody, it's, it's more accessible in many ways. And it's also now audio, so somebody could listen to it while commuting or, or whatever they might be doing. So this, I'm excited to see where this goes. Imagine, you know, now you may have the objective for your students to be able to read and understand and analyze the research in the way it was written, great. They do the article the way it was written. You may have the objective for them to understand the concept. They can now consume that in a different way and, and reach that. Um, so illuminate.google.com, I can put that into the chat. And I think I had it in the notes of the slide, but I'll pop it here for you. Okay. So that's exciting stuff. And again, with my UDL background, I thought, yes, hallelujah, here's a good example um, for in many ways. So let me go back here. 
Didn't want to do that. I want to get my slides going again. Okay. So let's take a pause and, and try and get you thinking again and sharing is, what if you could build your own double? You had your own bot, agent, whatever you want to call it, that is able to help you across your instructional workload and other things that you might do that are co-instructional or part of your administrative tasks, whatever it might be. What if you could have your own double? So let's go to this Padlet. And I've lost chat. Get it back up here. Come on. There we go. All right. So you do have the link in chat. And now I'm going to pop over there on screen share. And again, click that lower right plus and go ahead and start putting in your thoughts. These are anonymous, by the way. But if you can have an AI double of yourself for each of your students, what would you have it do? And you can think beyond interaction with your students. It can be tasks you're doing in your office, co-instructional tasks that aren't direct delivery with your students, but preparing for or doing assessments. And I don't want to say too much to steer your responses, but think broadly. And load all of my admi administrivia on it. Absolutely. <laughs> There's so much to be done and there's so much AI can do to draft things for you, let's say. Um, I created a great example of having it do letters of recommendation and taking the input from the student, then be able to put that through an intake form into a chat GPT prompt and come out with a personalized letter that you can then edit. And yes, personalized because it's taken all the student elements and then how you're directing it and bringing it together and then you put it into its final form very quickly. Because there are some boilerplate aspects to letters of recommendation, face it, even though you're personalizing those elements. Um, creating videos showing students how to complete tasks, so much that's coming up with that for sure. Double grade all of the assignments, or excuse me, grade all of the assignments, yes. And it could be first pass, and then you're able to scan that review and look for any red flags, look for times where you might have to check it for accuracy, but it can do the first load, first pass. Helping students practice in programming web development, for sure. And then they their task is to analyze that code or improve upon it. Answer very common questions, yeah. So it can be the virtual office hour ongoing um, support for your students. Individualized support, we're talking about that a lot. Um, repetitive questions, especially things related to the syllabus and the process for the course. Providing feedback, timely feedback, um, resources that they need in line. I like seeing formative assessments always and providing feedback on those. Low stakes, but still important to give feedback to. Data entry with grades, calling parents, explaining to parents why students need to be able to speak and understand the language in the language class. Yeah, that, that would be complicated to navigate. Um, students aren't necessarily going to want to hear from a bot, but it can help you in propping up communications. Great. And for time purposes, I'm going to go ahead and slip back out. Thank you for that. And again, you have ongoing access. And what I'll do is just show you from a prior session kind of a review of what has been said and you can compare it to what your responses were. Answering student questions, absolutely, because you get repetitive questions and you don't want to ignore students ever. You want to serve them, but those repetitive questions, sometimes you might put them into a Q&A discussion board, but this is even better because they can get it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, providing instant personalized feedback. I'm looking to see anything else that stuck out. Helping them understand grading. Um, so if there's a rubric, the AI can help to have that dialogue between the rubric and the student's performance and give them feedback and um, break down the grading. And let's see, coaching students on study techniques, facilitating group work. So it can help you to manage certain processes if students are doing group work, then how can it help to facilitate and manage that group work process? Um, or also mimicking or simulating workplace interactions with them, role playing, that's a great one. Okay, time check, uh, let's see, I'll call it 15 minutes since we started late. Um, let's go there and then Kristen, you can let me know when, when I reach the edge. All right, let me get back into slideshow. 
Okay. So I want to talk about Cogniti. And if you've heard of Cogniti, feel free to share in the chat. Um, this is something that actually comes out of a group from University of Sydney. And I've been doing sessions with Danny Liu from there. And, and he and his team of, of his colleagues, um, faculty, staff, and students heavily involved are creating this Cogniti app that instructors can use in their courses. And it's within the LMS. And these are kind of the things that they're looking at. You know, ChatGPT is great, OpenAI, all that, but it's $20 a month for somebody to use 4.0. If they're using 3, they're at a disadvantage potentially versus those that have the resources. There's also the control and safety that the open LLMs, you're putting your information out there, potentially personal information. Um, so you don't want to do that. So this is, again, within the instance within the learning management system for the institution. Also the hallucinations out there, the AI literacy and checking that's required. Those are good skills to have, but it'd be better not to have the hallucinations. It'd be better if it was grounded in your course content and knew what you wanted to focus on. And so Cogniti, I'll talk about briefly and um, again, chat disappeared. Okay. Go to Cogniti here. And there's a website for you to look at if you wanted to peruse more of what it's about, how they've developed these AI agents is what they call it. And then what I wanted to do is briefly look at this video. And so I know I have sound on. I'll give this a try. And I've got a couple of snippets that I'll show. One is Educators make context. such an impact on their students, but we can't always be available for them. We often wonder if only I could clone myself. What if this was possible? Imagine being able to give each of your students a double of yourself to support their learning 24-7. Cogniti is a generative AI platform that allows individual educators to build their own AI doubles to support student learning in ways that are specific, transparent, reliable, secure, and equitable. We teach biochemistry to 800 plus students and they come to us with thousands of questions every semester. And so having Cogniti means that they can have a dialogue 24-7 with this this agent and they can discuss the material, explain their understanding of it and get feedback on that. Interested in? I was a classroom Jump teacher. Jump to one more. Yes. So they could role play with a real classroom teacher, um, giving their occupational therapy plans and having a conversation with her and experiencing the real time feedback that a teacher might give um, you know, in that interaction. I'm not an IT coding person, um, but once I understood how the agent worked, I guess, and and you know how what I would tell it to do, how it might respond, um, it's been fairly easy. Cogniti puts you into the driver's seat of AI. Okay, I'll pause there. Feel free to share any thoughts. Um, it is free to adopt, Miranda. Yes, and so at the Cogniti website, they've got information about how to be able to um, bring that into your LMS, and obviously that involves your. Um, LMS administration team and them buying in and deciding whether or not that's something that can be done. So it isn't an individual choice necessarily. Um, so yeah, that's something to consider. But this is a great model. Other institutions are building their own versions. This is the best that I've seen. And what I love about this is it's being led by instructors, um, instructional staff, and students together. And there's a lot of learning science behind this in addition to the, to the knowledge about um, um, Gen AI. So in the quick examples you saw, the instructor was able to put in language. They weren't having to do coding. They were doing the conversation prompting. I don't like to call it prompt engineering because it doesn't need to be so technical. It's, it's communication. It's giving the open AI the information, the framing, the context, and the instructions, the role it'll play things you want it to do, things you don't want it to do, so that type of thing. And there are lots of examples within Cogniti, Cogniti that can help steer that. So I just think that's that's a great model of what we'll see going forward. Having it within the LMS is great for ease of access, but also putting those boundaries around where the information goes and what content it focuses on for the instructor. Um, yeah, Miranda, you know, there are several examples on the Cogniti website. I was keeping that pretty limited as far as sharing for time purposes. I know we're within the last 10 minutes here. Um, oops. And the live demonstration was actually had Danny Liu on at one time sharing a little bit. Um, so focus on instructional development. So we talked about personalized learning. We'll get a little bit more to the instructional development role. So what can be done? 
And this is where I've been working. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of things with Gen AI for different tasks, um, for the instructor, for assignments, all sorts of things, you, you name it, instructional and co-instructional. And this is focused on helping the instructor with course design or development, which is a big task. And so we've actually been looking at the role of the instructor and how much work they put into it. And in 2022, in the fall, we did a study. And then again, um, last fall, we did a study and we looked at over 500 faculty in each of those different faculty at each time. And we surveyed them on their experience with developing courses and maintaining courses and the types of things that they do. First of all, we looked at burnout, 53%. The year before, I think it was 51%. You know, the pandemic is not so much a pandemic anymore. It hasn't gone away. The, the resulting factors haven't gone away. The change hasn't gone away. And then, of course, now here comes AI and the changing workplace and student needs. So there's a lot to that that, of course, we found. But when we focused on the instructor and how they developed their courses and how much time they spent, they spent about 41 hours prep for a new course before the start of the semester. For a new instructor, that could be three or four new preps. So you're talking 120 to 160 hours. Typically, their contract starts two to th three days before the term. So that's a, that's a heavy load in even just getting started, which is overwhelming. But if you look at during the term, those nines, they told us that they spent nine hours a week per course tinkering, designing, redesigning elements of their course. And so in my experience in the Cal State system, typically full-time instructors taught four courses. That's 36 hours a week on that design, redesign, tinkering process. That doesn't count for contact time with students of 12 hours. That's 48 hours now. Um, office hours, let's just call it 50 hours now. You've got research, you've got committee work, you've got service, you've got all the administrative that some of you brought up earlier. That's a heavy workload. And we found that, of course, 69% told us they don't believe they have time to teach their courses effectively. And so we're really trying to lean into that. And we've been doing that for a few years pre-AI, but now really with AI, trying to leverage that even more. We want to relieve those pain points. We want to take pressure off. We'd love to see that number of 69% go down significantly. Those nines per course per week, could that go down to three? Um, so I think there is that potential with good um, course design and, and AI action plans. Um, we also asked these instructors, what are the most important things for the student experience? They said great things like engagement, collaboration, student connectedness, effective assessments, formative assessments, clear syllabus, accessibility, all those things that you would want to hear from instructors. In a different part of the survey, we asked them what they spent their time on. It was very much content focused. Um, which is kind of the traditional pattern. And that's kind of how faculty are brought up as being subject matter expertise um, individuals and not given the teaching expertise um, background or assessment expertise, all those things that go with the role. So we're trying to bridge those two areas of where faculty spend their time and are comfortable to where they really see, see what's most important and what a lot of the research says is most important, those things on the right. And we want to make it less burdensome. We want to make it less of a learning curve, less of a, a time suck to be able to do all those things. And so we've been looking at instructional development in a different way. We've developed these optimizers. And so this pre-AI, was a way where um, instructors could go through these forms that would ask them questions about what they're wanting to develop for their students. And it would help them to think about the right things and then they could put in their context where before if they just did a web search on how to group, develop a group project assignment, they would get taken all over the place. They would have to then try and figure out what's the best stuff to absorb, process, and then how do I create my own out of it? So we do that and then we put it into this optimizer and we lead them through that. And pre-AI, they would come out with this you know, stuff that they typed up that would be in the format that would be for the best group project assignment based on their goals. Now with AI, we're able to speed that up more quickly where they don't have to tell us as much. They just tell us the essentials and we're able to prop AI up with good prompting in the background and learning science baked into that that gets them the best resources in minutes um, where some of these things can take hours and hours um, to develop. And we got feedback that 71% of faculty pre-AI were telling us, you know, this helped us create better resources and or in less time. So now we're, we're gathering data on how they're doing it with our AI-enabled optimizers. And so let me back out here and go to 
website. Um, yeah. So this is just a really quick look at what a portfolio in our Curie platform could look like. This again, this is through Alchemy and this is our Curie platform. Um, so Marie Curie and kind of spinning off of that name a little bit, if you know her science background. So this is where I could go as an, in as an instructor and I could go into our discover section and I could look at a task that I'm trying to work on. And I've propped up, create a grading rubric. Grading rubrics are helpful in so many ways for transparency, for guiding the learner, for guiding your grading, feedback you give, transparency, all those things. But they don't get used often because they're complex to develop and they take time on the front end and it takes time to get to the benefits. And it, it takes some exp expertise to know how to do it well. So we've been able to prop this up where an instructor can come here to this resource and you can see on the left there are these um, six steps before the final review. And there's a couple examples. And if they turn on AI, then they can go in here and they can pick, well, maybe this is a presentation I want a rubric for. Um, number of points, let's say it's 50, and then they go to next. And that's working in the background. And then what are the criteria? I'll say content, organization, research, and presentation skills would be the criteria. You can select however many or few, and you can add your own criterion. And then and now it's developing um, definitions for each of those four that I selected. I can edit those at any time now or later, but I'm just going to go forward with those to the next screen. And now it's saying, okay, let's go with the grading values for those criteria, those four criteria for content. I'll say that that's important. I'm going to go with 30% organization. You know, it's not as critical. I want, I'm more concerned about their knowledge. Research and support, yes, that's important. Presentation skills, it's a nice to have. I'm going to put 20%. And it shows where you've added up to 100%. And it'll keep you there until you kind of get that finesse to 100%. And then you go to next. And then what levels of achievement? So again, rubrics have those levels of achievement and then should have descriptors for each. So I'm going to do exceeds. And then I'm going to say that it should be 90 to 100. I'm going to say meets. And I'm going to say, whoops, meets expectations. I'm going to say 80 to 89. You can change any of these levels, but I'm going to go very quickly. Below expectations, I'm going to say 60 to 79. And let's say I want to add another one. I'm going to just say insufficient. And then let's say it's anything from 0 to 59%. Now that I've got those levels, it's going to then build out the descriptions for each of the criteria and the four levels. Now that takes a lot of work to do as an instructor. And there's a lot of right sizing and balancing and all of that. It's tedious, um, especially if you know educational assessment's not your background. And for most people, that wouldn't be a part of your formal background. So it's now developed across those um, criteria and those respective levels, all the definitions. And then I can go in and review if I want to in a table format. And if we look at some of these levels here, you know, exceeds and meets, and you can see the different language if I just focus kind of at the midline. And I know we're at time, so I'm going to jump back. I just wanted to give you this quick example. Developing a rubric can take hours and hours, but something like this can now be done in minutes. And then you can adjust, whether it's adjusting the weightings or the criteria or the descriptions within any of these edit icons would take you back to that step. And then you'd be able to save forward and have the, the updated resource. And you're able to hit complete anytime you want and be able to download or share that rubric. If you have a colleague who's also teaching the same section type of experience, you can do that as well. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and go, you know, we're also doing the, this at the course level where we, from the instructor, we're able to take intake information. And I might stay in this mode for now um, since I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly. But we can get the general course info, the course outcomes, and do a faculty self-assessment of their different preferences, their modality, how much is student-directed, teacher-directed, um, formative assessments, all those things. And we can start building out courses pretty quickly to the modular level and the modular outcomes, the module descriptions, the um, activities, the assignments, assessments, whatever they might be, can start being built out. And then the media and all those things can start rolling out pretty quickly according to the instructor preferences. So a four to six month experience is typical for building a course. This, this can now be done in a matter of hours, days, or weeks, depending on what type of timeline people want to go after. Okay, 
Um, yeah, so Jean, Jean or Jean, um, Jean probably, I'm going to share a link where people can explore some of those resources in just a moment here. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to skip that slide and then accessing those resources, as I just said. I'm going to give you the link here. Uh, let's see, copy. There we go. And put it into the chat. I make sure I'm not just sending it to Kristen. So if interested, you've got the QR there or the link in the chat where you can explore some of those resources. We have a freemium where you get a you get ask a, access to a few of our um, AI generated optimizers and, and then some of our static resources as well. And then as far as AI, if you are interested, we've been doing a web series that's been really popular where we've had, you know, thousand to fifteen hundred people at a time signing up for these sessions. Um, but what we do is record them and we um, log all the resources and make all those openly available to everyone. So you can consume those in different ways. I have an AI um, prompting guide that I've created that's up there for all sorts of use cases. And then last, um, before looking to the chat and closing down is, if you are interested, we have this webinar navigating AI and assessment um, next week, looking at strategies for the new academic year. Um, that link I'll put into chat. And that's myself and Heather Brown, who does a phenomenal job. Um, she absorbs so much of what's happening out there is on and is on top of all the people who are the big thinkers and doing great things with AI and education. Um, so I love working with her and look forward to sharing through that session. I want to say thank you before the plug is pulled, and I'm happy to to look at any questions in here if there's time. And let me know if I've missed anything. And what I'll do is I'll put my contact info in here for you. And do know that I will upload the slides with a couple of the activities that you did um, summarized in those slides. So you'll be able to see that. And yes, I'm going to be sharing with Jeff and team, the and Kristen and team, the link um, to my slides to be able to put in Whova. And what else was there? And that'll lead you to everything. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Um, hope that was useful. A, a, a round of applause for Brett Christie. That was uh, great. Thank you, Brett. All right. Thank you, Ronald. Taking the time. And sorry about the mix-up at the beginning. Hopefully, all the links are correct now. Um, actually, I'm going to put the links in the chat to the different uh, rooms. So if you are interested in changing the track, oh, there they go. Thank you, Kristen. Um, the ethics track applications, the AI newbie, that we are in the applications now. Um, and then the other links are there if you scroll up to find Kristen's. Um, and if you have any questions for Brett, we have uh, about five minutes before the next one starts. Yeah, I'll stay on if anybody has any questions, feel free.